Let's call it Bear. It keeps it, it keeps it curious and interesting. So yeah, let's call it Bear. So obviously, we're here with Bear um, from Show Your Roll, and I got introduced to Show Your Roll uh, maybe five six years ago when I was first getting into jujitsu. I was talking to a group of friends of mine, and I was just asking, "Hey, who in the jujitsu space is known as like the best product and and whatnot?" And your guys' brand got brought up first and foremost, and I got my first gi from you guys, got some rash guards, and I've just been super impressed by Sherry Roll, the brand, the company, and then you and I have gotten to know each other over the years, and so I'm super excited to dive into Shoyer Roll. So before anything, let's just start here. What, what is Shoyer Roll, and where did the name come from? And then we can dive into a bunch of other great stuff. Uh, Jace, thanks. First, thanks for take, bringing me on, man. And uh, it's an honor to be on this show. And then also, uh, I'm a huge fan of you as an athlete <laughs> and everything that you're doing, Nancy. So uh, first of all, thank you for having me uh, on the show. So, but, uh, but the second part is, uh, uh, Shoroy, the, the name started as a high school kid coming out of, coming out of high school, just trying to tar- start a t-shirt company, going to print like five t-shirts or 10 t-shirts or making a sticker, or trying to do a little graphic on MS Paint. And at the time I came up on surfing, grappling, mixed martial arts culture, and then also um, skateboarding. So those are the influences that I had as a kid. So it wasn't really anything. It was just more of a fun, fun hobby back then. And just trying to be a creative kid. Um, and that was right, right around 99, 2000-ish going into college. And then, um, and then it was basically just three words the show your role. And that basically kind of go out and represent or show you know it was like almost like we tried to turn three things to show your role on the mat because we were that's when I heavily started to get into jujitsu and I started Um, but then we tried to like also use it as a a verb in a sense to like kind of like represent Um, and that's it's early days back in like 2099 ish oh okay okay so yeah I mean I was I was watching one of your previous um, you know podcast episodes and you were talking about how when you first started the company you were pretty kind of broad strokes you were in the the skating space the surfing space which you know i think a lot of there's a lot of carryover right there's a lot of carryover between jujitsu and surfing etc for some reason culturally they seem to kind of blend and when i was when i was watching or reading this article it was really saying how you honed in on jujitsu in particular which i want to get into but before we talk about that show your role so the way i'm hearing it i always thought about it as like show your role like directly on the mat like because we always talk about hey let's go get a roll in today right it's never like it's always just called a roll but you actually thought about it more in like the verb sense like what is your role type of thing that's 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 cool i didn't think about it that way yeah i think i think back then it was hard because we, you know i love jujitsu and but not like our circle of influence where we could sell product you know the 20 friends that i had that would actually buy a t-shirt it was probably more five friends would buy a t-shirt and have good give away 15 but that audience like not all of them rolled you know so it was like i couldn't say hey show your roll this is a jujitsu t-shirt or a grappling t-shirt like even within that tiny audience back in like 2000 like i almost had to like turn it into a verb back then like hey it means something it needs to represent yourself so like you know, I had to kind of give it a different definition um, back then, more so than now. Now it's like, no, it's like it's a jujitsu grappling based brand that makes martial arts uniform. But it wasn't always that way. So, so you opened, you started the company um, 20 years ago. When did you? Oh, sorry. Yeah, I think we printed our first T-shirt. It was uh, I, I can't remember if it was late in 99 or early in 2000. Um, so that's when we first started making and actually like printing t-shirts you know from my little garage um back in 2000 so and so when you guys started off you started off with t-shirts and then did you you mocked up all the designs and did you actually screen print them yourself did you have them outsourced how did how did it start like take us back (laughs) 20 years ago because then i'm going to fast forward to where you're at today which is a completely different landscape right and and for those of you who aren't familiar with your brand you you are the industry leader for geese in particular which you didn't even make to start off with, which is super interesting. <laughs> yeah, no, no. I think uh, back then we were just trying to do the best that we had. Yeah, I would design stuff and I was in, like, I can't draw for shit. Like, I'm sorry for saying that. Um, but I also can't like, I can't do too many, um, you know, I'm not that great with too many things when it comes to like creativity. I'm just trying to put together things more visually to what I, I was um, inspired by. So we created something on like MS Paint back then. 
that was the design program that was before Adobe. And then um, we basically just put them on like inkjet printers and just like used to cut out those heat transfers that you would buy from like, you know, Fry's or whoever the staple center was back then. And just like, you know, heat transfer them on with the iron back in like 2000 until, you know, maybe six months or a year when, you know, we could afford to go buy like 12 all style shirts or AAA shirts from the local t-shirt shop or, you know, and, and then at that point we're like, Hey, you know, we, ha I, we now have like hundred dollars or $200 saved up to go get, you know, 30 t-shirts silk screened at the local silk screen shop, you know, but that maybe that might have made me, that might have took a year, you know, roughly. So, so when you guys started off and you were starting your brand and you know, this podcast really is about the business side of fitness and you guys are in the jujitsu space. We mainly talk on the more functional training space, but it's all the same. When you, when you were coming up and you're building the business, you know, you talk about how you were kind of like trying to be everything to everybody, or at least started off as like a more of a t-shirt company. How did you know that you needed to hone in and go towards jujitsu? Cause I imagine that's pretty scary because over time honing in on a singular audience, I think is really popular or, or powerful, but like, how, how do you know what that audience is? And then how do you not second guess that maybe by going up to jujitsu, you're limiting your ability at skateboarding, for example? I think it's, it's interesting because I think a lot of, I think a lot of chance and luck played into it. And I'm, mm -hmm. uh, I'll be a hundred percent honest. It, it wasn't like, we weren't trying to be a, you know, a, a uniform company. Like in all honesty, we didn't know what the hell we were. We, we were just trying to figure it out every year. And, you know, we just kind of like kept on doing things and seeing what worked, seeing what didn't like, kind of back to your point, you know, whatever our references were at the time, we were like, Oh, you know, let's make a reggae design thing. Cause we love reggae. Oh, Hey, there's a surf skating thing. Let's do a surf skating thing. Cause we love surfing and skating. Um, hey, let's do this one little grappling thing because we love grappling. It was, we were all over the place. Um, and I think we just got lucky because uh, a friend at the time was making uniforms, jujitsu uniforms. And he's just like, hey, you want to make a jujitsu uniform with your logo on it? I was like, oh, that, that might be kind of cool. This, I think it's back in like 06 or something. And, um, but I was like, ah, we're probably not like, you know, only have so many friends that do things. So it would just be cool to see our logo on a kimono and a uniform yeah. because that's because I did it. So I did it purely based off of, you know, personal gain. Like I want a uniform with a logo on it. I, I had no real idea at that first point to be like, Hey, we want to be a uniform company. Um, and that was back in like roughly like Oh six ish around. And then, um, and then it didn't really, you know, we weren't really serious about it. It was just, how oh, we made another thing. Um, and then I think when we, when it came the time to like re-explore that, Hey, maybe we could do it again. And I think I took it a little more serious at the time. I was like, okay, this is our second one. Mm -hmm. The first one was just putting our logo on something. Um, let's really try and like give it a sense of like personal taste and flavor of something that I would personally want in the, if I wanted to make my own dream uniform, you know? And, um, and back then, you know, there was like maybe one or two companies within the U S that were doing anything um, close to, personal flavor and taste back in like 06, 07. The uh, yeah. majority of all the uniforms and stuff were coming in from overseas. Yeah, like Pakistan's um, a big spot from them, right? Yeah, I and mean, I think back then it was more Brazil so than Pakistan. Pakistan really wasn't even, uh, there was almost zero taste and style or, um, or options as far as like any type of, um, any type of creativity or aesthetic when it comes to a uniform because it was a super traditional martial art. So let's, let's talk about that. So from 2000 to 2006, seven, you're primarily making what t-shirts. Yeah. I was maybe making like 50 t-shirts, you know, every year or 150 t-shirts every year, different designs. And I was just kind of like a creative fun t-shirt brand. It was really more of a hobby more than anything else. I'd make a little money, but every year basically the decline because I was running out of people to sell. I was running out of my friends to sell it. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> So, so this was, so what else were you doing um, during 2000 and 2006, seven? Were you, you I was working day jobs, you know, I was trying to go to school. I was uh, training a lot of jujitsu, you know, um, and just kind of just trying to like, trying to just like go into a lot of concerts, reggae concerts, and just trying to live life as a teenage college and more so like a college kid in my twenties, you know, so. So you, so these, these, you call them uniforms. I think that's, that's a, a powerful term for it. For those who are unfamiliar with that, a, a, a gi, um, how can you best describe this uniform you're referring to or, or better, or also known as a gi? Um, 
I, I think I think it would be the I think the most generic term for the average listener to pick up on it is just think of your average karate kung fu uniform you used when you were five years old back in like the eighties or seventies where whatever time you you came up in you know it's basically that just a heavier a heavier fabric that's more catered towards grappling but very similar to that. And so when you guys, you know, six, seven, and you start making your first, making your second, the gi or the uniform is such a specific uh, material because if it's too thin, right, it could rip, it could tear. If it's too thick, it's very stiff and aggressive. And so it sounds like you saw, um, did you see like a gap in the market? Is that what happened? Because, you know, um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu is really, um, correct me if I'm wrong, but jiu-jitsu is really uh, originated in Japan then got introduced to Brazil, where it was then converted or, or adjusted or developed into Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, but the stylistic of the uniform of the gi still came back from Japan. Is that, is that accurate? Yeah, yeah, no, I think you're, 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 you're right on very close, and I'm not like a history major or anything like that, so, <laughs> uh, but you know, like I'm pretty sure like Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu was a modified version of Japanese Jiu-Jitsu, and you know, there's probably a lot of elements in Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu that we're still in old traditional jujitsu nuas or whatever, but I think, um, but you know, Brazil, Brazil and the Gracies, they made it famous once it hit the UFC and then it started to become like really popular. Now it's kind of like the new karate or kung mm -hmm. fu that you would put your kids into. It's becoming very popular within, you know, pop culture in a sense. But your first gi, now when you made it and what was, so what was different about yours and then how, what opportunities you see in the industry? Cause I'm curious. Well, I think at that time, at that time, they had like, as far as like customization and style, stylizing a gi, like you would have com companies that would just, you know, for the most part, just look like a regular playing karate gi that's been the same for like 100, 200 years, never changed really, right? right. Um, every now and then, like a company might put like one graphic on it, or one big patch somewhere, and that would be their stylized version of what a uniform would look like. And that would still be a very loud example. It's like you might see, you know, a, a company in Brazil put out a patch back in, or put out a kimono back in like 2003. It would have one American flag to represent America. And then the other half was a Brazilian flag. Mm -hmm. And like, that was all that was there. Company logos on the sleeves. And that was as crazy as, as you got. And the, uh, the other side was like, you might get a company that puts out a white color gi, a blue color gi, and a black color gi that was it like it didn't really veer too far from that um and i think um i think so you know we for me i was like oh, i was a skater kid and i wanted like i wanted reggae stripes and all kinds of stuff so i just tried i basically at that time i was like hey on the second one i want to try and put some things that are personal to me that i find interesting that i like um into my own gi and then also i tried to scan the space i was like a I was like a uniform geek, right? Like I saw every single brand. I saw what was good, what was bad, what I liked, what I didn't like about them. And I was like, oh, I want to pick all the best things of what all the brands in the space that I had access to and kind of build my own dream uniform. You know, the fit of this kimono, the fabric of this kimono, you know, um, the, style, the way that these guys are styling the cuff on this one thing or the knee pad. And like I just basically kind of built my own um, personal favorite kimono basically. Now you were in, cause you're in Southern California now, where, where back then did you get um, the material from? Did you, did you sew it yourself? How did you guys make the, your original geese? Where were they made? No, and those, those, and during those same times we got lucky because um, the manufacturer was already set up in Pakistan and they were making, you know, they've been making martial arts uniforms in the space for forever. Um, but we just had, we already got lucky and we had access to a factory. So right away, we just basically had to design here. And we're like, hey, let's just start mocking and designing, cutting up pieces and seeing visually what we want. And then after that, we just gave our design uh, to, our, the, to the factory overseas. And then they kind of started producing protos and stuff like that. So, Wow. So fast forward 20 years from there. I mean, show your role has really turned into, a, you know, in the, in the jiu-jitsu space in particular, um, a very high ticket item. What you guys have done is so unique. Because I, I was just on eBay right before I started talking to you and you could see your products at a premium that are being sold even pre-owned and you guys do small batch, you do limited runs, your business model is significantly different than most businesses where most businesses might have their staple items and then maybe a few special, you guys kind of do it totally different. So 
when you started, um, before we kind of get to where we're at today, how did that evolve? Because at what point were you able to stop doing side jobs and make sure you're all your full-time gig? And when did you know the, the whole gi thing might actually turn into something special? Uh, I, I want to say back in like 2000. So we started making geese probably like roughly 2006, 2007 ish. Right. And I think we started to like really start to pick up, um, moving units and people like it was starting to become a thing. There was a small audience of people, you know, whether it be 50 or hundred people that were really looking to kind of support what we were doing. They liked the, the, the mood and the flavor of the brand back then. And that was probably like 2010. And fast forward it, I think around 2012-ish, we started to see like a lot more traction. And at the time, I just, I think um, I, uh, I was getting close to having my first kid. And then I was kind of climbing the ranks of my job and my corporate career. And I was actually getting paid a lot of money and I, more money than I've ever made. So it was really hard for me to stop at that point just because I was climbing the ladder, the corporate ladder, and I was doing well in my career. Um, had a mortgage, the whole thing. Um, so uh, I think what happened was I saw there was, we, I had a kind of a small window, right? I was working eight to, I was working like eight to five or six every day, spend time with the fam as much as I could, but I'm emailing during, during work the whole time. Mm-hmm. And then, uh, you know, for a long period of time, I like, once it hit like 9 PM, the kids went, kids went to sleep. I would work from like 9 PM to like 3 AM. Same thing. Like I'd run that for like three, four years. Um, so, um, but once I started to, once I couldn't juggle both, um, and I was starting to miss emails because like, it was just too busy between work life. And, you know, I was trying to hustle both at the same time. I already started to know like, okay, our quality of service, I can't even answer emails anymore because I'm working my day job. Um, I was like, I I need to make a jump. And luckily enough, the brand had enough forward movement. You know, I could see sales coming in. So uh, I had like three or four months worth of savings. So I was like, screw it. I was like, um, if there's ever a time to jump now, I'll I'll try it. You know, when was that? I want to say it was around two. I I can't remember exactly what year I quit my job, but I want to say it was around 2012 to 2000. 13 roughly around that time you know um, so so okay you start the company in 2000 kind of mm-hmm. kind of you know play you know small time you fun. still have some regular jobs yeah for fun 2006 7 you start making geese start seeing some success and then you find so then simultaneously you find a corporate job i imagine what was happening is you need to find a way to pay the bills but the jujitsu was kind of a, a passion project so as those two move concurrently and obviously have kid and, and mortgage, I mean, who was, did you have a staff at show your role that was supporting you? <laughs> no, I did. I didn't. You know, my wife would, would help me like on emails and stuff, but she had a job too. Right. And she just had a, you know, she had, she just had my, my son. So it was like, a, oh it was, a, it was, it was a little like, um, you know, it was a little busy on all fronts if, if anything. So, uh, it was me for the most part, there wasn't anybody really at the time. So, um, I, I we didn't have staff. Like it was, it was a total hobby that kind of picked up slowly with time. And I was just trying to juggle it as long as I could. And then, um, and then it came to a point where like, you know, I was, or my wife was actually the first employee for the company because it got to a point where like, Hey, I'm making decent money. Maybe you can, you know, you just had a, you just had a, uh, uh, you just had a, a baby. Maybe you can catch up on emails and like, I can run this for like another year so we can pay mortgage and stuff. And, you know, maybe that would work, you know, but then it came to a point too, where I'm like, like the, like this thing really needs me you know, and if I can't, like, if I can't commit now, I'm probably going to miss the wave or it's going to be a worse version of what it probably would be in three years. So I needed to try and take that jump, you know, so. So what were you doing for your corporate job? I was doing, I was managing an outside sales team and they're doing like security and stuff. So it was kind of like daily grind, outdoor sales, you know, just kind of like numbers every month. You think you're going to get fired. You have to fire people, hire people. You know, uh, it was, it was, it was kind of intense, you know, like, and it wasn't like, it wasn't like, I wasn't like a career guy. I freaking hated the average sales guy. Like I, it just wasn't me, but, um, luckily enough, I like, luckily enough, I figured it out. And then, you know, I think I did it for like three or four years. Um, and then after that it was done, but it wasn't like, it was just like a random job I got and I was like unemployed before that. So, wow. And so this, I mean, this is a really, it, it's really so did you, was it just like a one night thing that just sparked you? So I've had similar situations in business where I'm like overly stressed. I'm up super late trying to figure something out. And I knew the next day I needed to go hire someone to go help us with that, that particular thing. Was it just one night where you just woke up? You're like, dude, there's way too much business coming in. 
I need to just go quit or did it happen slowly over time? Was it just like a, was it like a triggered moment for you? You know, it's, it's, it's weird because I think it's one of those things. I don't know if it's like yes and no. I think, I think the problem is maybe just um, one, not having enough experience and one, not maybe having mentors around to kind of tell you what not to do and what to do. And you're just kind of figuring it out. So, you know, someone like I, it got, to, but my tolerance, I pushed my tolerance too far. You know, like it got to a point where it's like, you probably should have hired someone a year ago. Yeah. You know, you probably should have paid the money. You probably should have just bit the bullet, you know? And like, I, I would take too much on personally and be like, oh yeah, I could pack stuff. I can answer emails. I could do this. And I was doing everything at like a really shitty level, Yeah. you know? Um, and then it came to like, it always got to the tipping point. I, that's how I like, that's how I would refer all the growth stages of the company is it, it always got to a tipping point where it was almost too far or too late to where we had to make a, we had to make a change to the last, like, um, the last 10 years. And I've changed my mindset a lot over like the last three years. Um, but I still kind of fall into those same, you know, that same bad habit of what I used to do as a small business slash family owned and operated business kind of thing. You know, if that makes any sense. Yeah, no, it, it makes a lot of sense. And so I have a question for you. Do you think looking back and then, and then we'll talk about Ford, but looking back on 2012, 13, if you had hired someone a year earlier or quit your job a year earlier, would you be two years ahead of where you're at today? What, what, do, what do you think? What do you think about that? I'm just curious. Uh, yeah. You know, I, 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 it's, it's funny because I guess it depends, right? Our, our, our situation was unique, right? So uh, stuff was going fast. Right. So I think that there's a, a big difference between like, if you're just jumping on a dream, you know, and there's no customers, you know, I think there, that, that might be a different, um, a situation compared to at least where we, where I was, you know, for us, we had customers, stuff was busy. Um, it was more me just trying to get the best of both worlds, a corporate paycheck mm. and, you know, a lot of customers and it, the business starting to like pick up. Um, so for us in that same question, I think, yes. I think if we did, you know, start a year earlier, hired somebody earlier, um, we would have been way better off than we were now, you know, and I think, um, uh, but, but in vice, you know, in re if it was the other way around, if we didn't have customers and it was slow and we were just trying to build a brand, um, then that might've been a different situation, you know, so. So you talk about building a brand. I think you guys have done an incredible job of that, right? You sponsor some major athletes. Um, you know, I'm sure there's been a few of them along the way that really helped you know, kind of put your brand in the, in the forefront. Um, I know of a few of them. Um, and my, my question for you is that you do, uh, I took down some notes, you know, you really changed the industry. Um, your geese started to look good. They seem to be more form fitting. Am I, am I correct by saying that? Uh, I feel like a lot of other geese, at least traditionally back then, they would kind of be really big in nature. You guys came out with almost like a, for lack of a better term, and I'd say this with all due respect, almost like a skinny jean version, right? Like back in the day, like the big baggy jeans were popular and then all of a sudden skinny jeans came in. Is that kind of what you guys did as, as part of it to, to, to change the industry up? Is you made it more trendy? Is, you know? Uh, yeah, I think, I think it's even, um, even uh, I, think, I think trendy was more so on, uh, maybe on like personal aesthetic and design, right? Like theming stuff in different colorways and changing the way it physically looks. I think, uh, I think for sure we were probably on the early stages of that with a few other companies early. Um, but I think the biggest thing I think that changed within the space is before it was very traditional, kind of going back to like the stuff's been like this for a hundred years and companies and other, every single martial arts, they're like, Hey, we have four sizes. That's what we have. That's what we use. It's never going to change. There's no reason to change. Mm. Um, for us, we came in from like a fit. We understood that like fit was very, very important. And to, er to every practitioner, uh, but we knew that people probably didn't want to explore that space because you would have to order, you know, you're going to a specific niche. And then whenever you're going to a specific niche and body type, you might have like overages and sizes and backstock. The same way if you were to buy shoes, you know, like majority of sizes are from size eight to 12. Anything right. below that or anything above that, it's kind of specialty or not like 80% of the population. So we were like, hey, like, let's try and like, target some of these body types and let's take four sizes and let's try and make eight sizes, you know, like let, instead of the, instead of the tall guy wearing the same 
big gi that someone that's 300 pounds would wear because that's the only option he had to make sure it was long enough for him. Um, before they used to make a one size fits all. You literally only had four sizes within the space. And you know, within two years, we've transitioned that to having like close to 14 sizes. So that, the, the, the standard before we, we got into the space was four sizes. Two years into it, the standard was 12 sizes. So range wise, as far as options of fit, changed dramatically within two years. And for us, that was a big, that like, for me, that was the biggest thing is I want to change and give options for people to wear something that fit their body type a little better. The short guy that weighs 200 pounds or the tall guy that's six, six, that weighs 200 pounds. There yep. wasn't anything for those two people per se. And for those unfamiliar with the jujitsu, I mean, typically it's what a one, a two, a three. And is there an a four? Yeah. There's basically like four sizes like that. Yeah. Yeah, so like um, I'm an A3. Small, medium, large, extra large, really? You know? Yeah. Um, uh, yeah, so that's super interesting to me. Now, I, I, when you guys got into the jiu-jitsu or the, the gi game, and you start talking about going from four sizes to 12 or eight even, I imagine inventory starts to become a concern because if you take on a bunch of inventory, especially as a smaller company, you can't take on a ton of inventory. So is that how these small batches came to be? Is that how the, fr the foundation of Show Your Roll was created? Is because you built up a demand from a small batch to not have excess inventory. And I'm totally reading into this. I'm just asking the question. No, no, no. I think it, it, was, I think it was a few different things. I think that first, I think one was we didn't have enough money to buy all that stuff. <laughs> so so that, that started small batch, right? Like right. we literally probably could only afford to pay for 50, right? So right. it's like, it's not it's like people call it supply and demand, you know, that's, that's the official business term for it. But it's like, no, we just didn't have any freaking money. You know? right. and, and then the other side was like the, like since the beginning, I'm, I'm from a small island, uh, Guam, and, um, and it's a small place. And anyone that's from a small place understands like when you go to, you know, a, a party or a, an event or a festivity, you're seeing the same people you probably would have seen, or you guys all shop at the same place because there's not many other places to shop. So for, for me coming up as a child and as a youth, uh, like, I always wanted something that was different. You didn't want the same t-shirt that you guys all could have bought. That was just very common, small town. That was very common in small towns. So for us, it was like, hmm, like every single gi that we see around, you know, everyone's shopping at the same place. Like it's not any different. So it was like, hey, well, why don't we just make 50 geese? That's what we can afford. One, two, we'll move on. Even if they want that one, at least they won't be able to get that one, you know, and then we'll move on. So I think those really, in all honesty, were the two biggest components. It was one, that was what we could afford to pay for. We were just like a starting, struggling company. And then two was more so, um, uh, it was just like we wanted people, when they wore that gi, the possibility of someone else wearing that gi was very, very uh you know, it was rare. And I think um, that along with, you know, what it turned into over time, um, we just kind of said, Hey, though, this is our thing. It seems like we got something going. Um, let's kind of just stick with it. So. Yeah. I, I love that analogy with Guam. I mean, I knew you were from Guam and I think you go back there every now and then, right? Totally. I try and get back at least once a summer if I can. So. Yeah. And so that's really interesting because when you're on an Island, I, yeah, you're totally right. You know, everybody, everybody, there's probably a lot of the similar stuff. Huh. That's, that's really cool. Um, okay. So fast forward, right? Your, your business now, you get into this small batch for the reasons you, you explained, which I think are really powerful. And now how has the team grown um, from when you kind of decided, hey, I'm all in 2013, I'm quitting my job, I'm all in. Here we are seven years later. How has that team grown um, from HQ perspective? I mean, are you guys how many employees, what does that look like now? I'm just curious. Yeah, well, I think we're, we kind of, I think we got up to like 12 or something like that. Like we were up to 12 and, you know, like right now I think we're roughly like eight. Um, and, you know, it kind of fluctuates through time, right? Depending on, you know, we're bringing in outside people to help um, every year and that's kind of coming in and out. But I think, uh, I think for us, the biggest change from that time to now is I think in the beginning, we were just trying to like keep the, we were trying to keep the, uh, the ship, a float. We were just like so busy and we were just trying to keep up with stuff from like, you know, it was a good problem to have. Um, I think from, from 2012 or whatever, when we started, when we started to pick up, like there was only like five companies within the space, right? Mm. The small little niche space. Then because we kept things so choked and small, like literally within 
you know, the product was so high in demand in like two or three years, there was over a hundred companies, two years. So it went from a space that there was only five of us playing in that, that category to like, you know, they're like, Hey, if people don't want to make, if these guys don't want to make more of these things, we'll give all these guys, all these options. So like, so competition just like quadrupled in like a year or two. So it changed the landscape of the space. Um, and literally like in turn in two years. So, um, but we still had to like hold to our gun, you know, so almost in a sense, it created this new vacuum of a whole new industry, um, that really wasn't existent. And the pro and we were, we weren't really even playing with the rest of the, 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 the rest of the space that we didn't want to touch, you know, so. So, uh, you know, jujitsu is exploding right now. It was probably, you know, not as exploding back then, but still was, but you now went, you know, what, uh, 20 times or you know, whatever the, the amount of companies that were in the space when you got into it, your model, can you just talk me through your business model from a small batch share on social? It basically sells out like instantly. What does that look like? I mean, what, what is, how do you do it? Yeah, I think, I think, well, I mean, we, you know, I think what we, for the longest time we would buy and we would sell direct, right? One, because uh, one, because, uh, one because retailers didn't 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 even know about us. We couldn't get into accounts back then. So um, so we're like, oh, let's just go direct to consumer. We'll just sell on our website. We'll try and drive people to our website. And then um, and you know we just order product. We would just try and figure out you know we'd run the math on how many people how many orders we got last time. Like oh that's a safe order for the next one. Let's just try and not go too crazy. Let's try and not go too uh, too low, not too high. So every every single release or every time we put in an order we were kind of trying to do like a market analysis of like how many more, how many less we could do. We still t do that till, till this day. Um, but you know, it was, we were never set up for distribution. So, um, so we're always consistently like tracking data. Like it's the stock market literally. Right. Like, uh, we're like, we're like, Oh, she's, it was like five minutes. We sold out. Could we have made like 50 more? <laughs> oh, the next time. Oh, wow. We just sold out of like, you know, two times that volume in 30 minutes. Could we sell more? And then like next one, like, Oh yeah, well, well that one went slow, you know. She's and it's like, well, what what were the factors? Color, blah blah blah. Then you're like, you're run, you're literally running like an on-demand analysis during a sale, trying to figure out all the all the reasons on why why you sold so fast or why you're selling so slow. And that's that's happened since the inception of the company. You know, when we started selling kimonos back in '08, straight or back then. So, um, how many geese you put out a year? Uh, you know, right now we've we've scaled back. Um, but I would say probably different, different styles are probably putting out maybe, you know, I don't know. She's at least 15, 10 to 15 different models. You know, some are big, some batches are a lot bigger than others. Some are smaller, just depends on the project, you know? So. Yeah. But like 10 to 15 unique designs that go out of here and you're monitoring. That's pretty interesting. Cause you're like real time <laughs> trying to figure out, Hey, do we over order? Do we under order? And, um, that's pretty fast. It's it's kind of it's it's kind of uh it's 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 kind of taxing, man. After doing after doing oh. the same same crap for like after doing the same crap and trying to do market analysis on every single release and trying to you know this because you, yeah. you, you you have to do the same thing with 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 your business, but just trying to figure out what the market is and what your consumer wants. Are you coming up? Are you coming down? Um, it's 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 a little it's it's a little taxing, but it, that's what makes it fun as well. So so do you think with Show Your Roll in the future you will have um you will have just staple items that will always be on there. Or do you think you'll consistently be doing this? Yeah. The, fun, the funny thing is like maybe over the, like the last three years, that's been the transition, right? It's like, Hey, we don't have to sell out. Like, every, like, cause it got to a point where it was just like, it was like one, it was unsustainable. Two, it was crazy stressful, you know? And then three, it's like, Hey, we needed something a little more stable. So like, you know, over the last three years, it's like, Hey, instead of like product selling out in, you know, five minutes, let's like, let it try and last for like a, a few hours. And after that, it's like the next year, it's like, Hey, let's try and let it last for like a few days or a few weeks. And then the next year is like, Hey, like that stuff should be in stock at least for three months, you know? So that's kind of where we're at right now. It's like, Hey, if we make product, let's try and make it live at least order enough to, you know, be in stock for, for three months, you know, and then hoping we release enough stuff in between that time to where like they can pick an offering, but you know, they can always find this staple product for three months at least. And I think the goal is to hopefully have an annual product, but for us, we always like fresh new change, even if it's something uh, very minimal. Um, so that's kind of where we've 
right? And the problem is sometimes we undershoot that and it's like the product that was supposed to be in sale for three months now is only on sale for a month. So we're getting better at it, but we're kind of trying to go away from, we've been trying to go away from that model over like the last three years. So got it. And so, you know, starting a gi company um, or a uniform company, growing it to where it has becoming full time over the last, like, I don't know, eight, nine years, from a business perspective, if you were to give advice to a, you know, someone who is interested in starting up a, um, cause you, you, you have a, you have a product, right? At our gyms, we sell more of a service. We have a, you're a little bit more product focused. Yes, we sell t-shirts, but that's more to build the brand. You actually sell a, a, a geek. Um, what would you do differently? I mean, starting a, selling a product. I mean, if you can, what would have been the biggest challenges for you? I, I, I think the biggest thing is just like really seeing if there's like a need for the product, right? Like I think, and I think the, I think those are probably for me, just building a, a brand. I think one, the hardest thing is making sure that the product itself, it's unique and there's a need for it in the space. And then kind of like looking at what's available on the space. That's purely on the product side on design and functionality of whatever the product is. And I think the, um, I think the other part is the brand part of it. I think the branding and the marketing part is, the stuff I obsess about. Um, so, um, so for me, it's, it's a little bit of both. I think, uh, you know, a lot of people create things when they're maybe there, there's not a huge demand for what they're trying to create or a bunch of competitors that do that very well. Um, and I think, um, for me kind of looking back, um, I would have just tried to like really double down on, you know, educating myself more on, you know, marketing, scaling, and maybe even more just on business, right? Like I, yeah. I, 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 didn't, I didn't, I didn't understand business and I didn't have a team around me that understood business. I just kind of learned as I went and I, and kind of going back to that same analogy, I kind of held on too long, you know, when I think if I had, you know, a stronger team that kind of understood some of this stuff for myself, or if I would have got educated on some of those things earlier, I think I would be able to make some better decisions back then, you know, so. I, I, yeah, I feel the exact same way for our business. And so for you guys, show your roles really established itself. I mean, I, I would call it like the, I don't know, uh, Mercedes Benz. I mean, I, I don't know, so like the higher, higher quality, more, a little bit more expensive, more elite style, but you guys have kind of earned that. So yes, you do small batches, but it's also like when you wear a show your role, it, it represents something. So like, is there something in particular that you guys have done that you think is just exceptionally kind of fostered that sense of culture that when you wear that, you feel this way? I think for us, I think we've, we've been very grounded and rooted to the, to the sport and to the culture of what jujitsu and grappling is, you know? So that's, that's at the core of it, right? Like any brand or any company can come in with, with a million dollars or, you know, a hundred thousand dollars and put some, you know, put some athletes, you know, in a picture on Instagram and brand and say, Hey, we're a jujitsu lifestyle company. You know, I think, um, I think that's a little, that's easy for any sport or culture nowadays, right? Like you don't even have to, you just have to have a cool Instagram uh, to, to, and a, and a decent looking website to sell a, a life, let's call it a lifestyle. Um, but I think what, what, I think what happened, I think what, what, what the interesting part is the, for us, we were doing it when there was zero money. And for us back then, and you know this as well, probably being in, in the space, you know, when, when, when people used to associate grappling or let's use jujitsu specifically, there was no brand to like associate it with. Like you would have to, like before in the very beginning of the company, we would have to put jujitsu, the text jujitsu on our t-shirts graphically so people could buy the t-shirt so they can go to the store and the next person that they saw in the store that did jujitsu, they'd be like, hey, you do jujitsu. Like that was the, that's how we moved product before. That's how we sold product before. So people that did it could relate. And then over time it was like, Hey, no, let's just invest in culture. Let's invest in the things that we do, the sport, the elements of what makes this thing pure, you know? And then alongside that, let's build our brand and connect our brand to this culture. Right. So, so at, with time, no different than Nike did with running. Right. Um, or Reebok did with CrossFit. Right. It's the same thing. It's like, It'd be the, but the difference was our brand was built on this sport art and lifestyle. And then with time, it was like, Hey, with time, if people could just start wearing our logo shirt and it just had our logo on it, um, hopefully with time, the comp, the other jujitsu person that knows of our brand knows it signifies 
this culture that we both love. And it, it could not have any jujitsu on it specifically. It could just be signified through the logo, through branding and marketing and just being grassroots over the yeah. past, like 15, 20 years, you know? So, well, I'm here to tell you that you've done a good job of that because I was in New York and I was wearing your show your roll, uh, black shirt with a black logo on it, kind of like a gray logo, super simple show your roll shirt. I love it. It's very basic. And this like a uh, security guard just looks at me, the big guy, he just looks at me, he's like, nice shirt, brother. And he just kept walking, you know, but, but you could tell right there and then, right. I looked at him, he looked at me, he knew that I ruled, uh, rolled jujitsu and I knew that he did jujitsu because there was just that, that, that connection there. So back to your point, that's really fascinating how you guys started off adding jujitsu to it, but then over time kind of let it stand on its own, which I think is brilliant. Um, moving forward, you know, you, you've seen jujitsu sport really take off. Uh, this sport, the methodology, all of it, right? Um, I think there's actually going to be a lot of people from the CrossFit space that'll, that will convert or shift over to jiu-jitsu. I think that for those people who are interested in learning new skills, developing themselves, you, after you've done complex gymnastics and weightlifting for a while, there, there is at some point where you start, kind of like the skill set starts to, okay, you, you pretty much have a baseline of most of it. But in jiu-jitsu, I mean, I've been doing it for a while, and I know you've been doing it a lot longer than me. I, I always feel like there's something to learn from it. And for those people that are interested in learning like that, jujitsu is a fascinating sport. And so I think from CrossFit, it'll, it'll be a big carryover. But I guess my question is, you know, where do you think jujitsu is going in the future? Um, because I, I imagine, uh, have you seen, what growth have you seen? I mean, do, can you quantify it? And then what do you think is going to happen in the future? Yeah, I think what's interesting is, uh, it's interesting because I think, you know, with the popularity of the UFC and kind of where it's come, at least from when I've been watching it back in 2000, like, it's just, it's only going to get bigger, right? Um, the sport itself, I think, think it's going to slowly grow. I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it's going to grow as fast, the sport specifically, but as far as like the art and, you know, being accessible for more people to do it, I think that's going to grow tremendously because I think, you know, people are putting their kids in it. It's kind of like the new karate or taekwondo that you would have put your kid in to kind of, you know, defend themselves or build some confidence. So I think, I think, I think the future of it is bright purely based off of what I just said on these kids that start now, you know, and they do it for, you know, cause mom and dad put them in it, you know, for, for, to, to defend themselves and they did it for two years, they quit. And then maybe they might come back later on down the line because it's, um, it's a little more common for me. That specifically is what excites me about the future of it. We've never had that ever. And now, you know, maybe in the last eight to 10 years is when, you know, kids training in gyms or academies um, became common. That was never common before. So now it's standard in every city for you to sign up your kid for jujitsu, you know, like they were, like they would with gymnastics or whatever. And I think that's what's the exciting part about the future growth is now that the youth will start to slow, it'll, it'll become normal and they've heard about it before. Um, that makes me more excited more so than the sport itself. I think the sport will remain the sport and it'll grow slowly. But for me, I'm more, I'm more, I'm more interested in the mom, the yeah. dad, the kid and the average practitioner or the auntie and uncle that have never heard of jujitsu and what's their perception of it. So for me, that's our biggest goal as a, as a brand is to push that part deeper and bigger as opposed to just like always driving the sport, which we've been big on, you know, the last 20 years. So. Have you um, taken on any partners over the years or is this yeah. a show your old? Yeah. So you show your old, you know, you've, you've just done it. You built it. Yeah. Yeah. No, we've, we've been fortunate enough to where we've never really needed capital, you know, like luckily enough, the business has always been stable and, you know, and dependent. We never had to take out any loans or anything like that. It was like, we got really lucky, you know, and we've never had to, you know, we've found different partners in Japan and Europe that we trust that are basically our, you know, there are partners there to distribute direct, you know, direct to consumer. But other than that, like as far as here, we've, it's just been a lot of trial and error, man. And it's been the same thing every single year. We re try and re reinvent ourselves every year. So when you go to, um, by the way, congratulations on that accomplishment. That's great. And when you go in and you, you sign athletes, was that a big learning curve for you? I'm, I'm curious, like, what does that process look like? I mean, I know you obviously sign people you align with that have core values with you and whatnot, but, I imagine that, that that's difficult because now this person is out there representing your brand and it's not you and it's out of your control. I mean, how, how has that process been? I'm just curious. Uh, it's, it's been, it's been 
it's been a learning experience, right? And it's been, a, <laughs> and it's been, a, it's also been like, depending on where the company was at its time or like in, in the level of where it was, you know, from the growing stages of the company to where it was a lot more stable and, and it was known to like today, right? Where we're strategically figuring out who we want to align ourselves with. Um, it's, it's, it's been challenging and it just depends on the state of where we, cause we pivot literally every single year. What we were last year is completely different of what we're trying to do this year in terms of athlete, in terms of direction of a company. Like it's, it's always this unstable thing that's shifting, not so much from a business standpoint, like business is always, you know, it's always unstable. That's just business. Yeah. <laughs> but for, yeah. for us as a company, like we, we, we always try and break it down. Like we try and make it so hard. Like it makes no sense. And maybe it's just me, but like, cause we, we have to be the leaders in the space. And anytime someone gets closer to anything that we're trying to do, we go exact opposite. It's so it's like, um, so it's, it's, it's interesting, man. It's like one of those things where it's like, you know, f three years ago or five years ago, it's like, Hey, let's get the all star cast, the best athletes in the world, just good advocates that we, 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 we endorse that we think are, are great or push our mission, you know? And then, two years from now, it might be like something else. So it's like, we're this evolving thing that net, that always changes. Um, so from an athlete standpoint, what we get today might be completely different than what we get um, next year. So it's not, it wasn't, it was never this simple thing for us. Like in the beginning, it was like, Hey, let's get the top cool athletes or let's get the cheapest athletes that we could get. Cause that's what we could afford. Right. Right. Or right. let's just get the pinnacle athlete. Um, and that's still a little bit of our mindset but it's no longer our primary mindset, if that makes any sense. Yeah. Well, man, it sounds like you've surrounded yourself with a really cool team. Congratulations on the success. And the idea about being in Guam and not wanting to see the same shirt all the time, I totally, re I, I totally get that because you show up to a jiu-jitsu school and for the most part, now some schools, they have rules, right? You have to wear all white geese or whatnot. Um, but, but, you know, a lot of schools don't have that, right? Um, and that, that, that's fascinating about what you're saying. Um, I got a, uh, if, if you're, if you're in the jujitsu space, you haven't checked out Sherry Roll Geese, they definitely are unique and they come with a lot of really cool designs. And I like your rash guards. I wear rash guards every day. Um, they're, they're just great. So thank you for making a great product. Thank you for creating an awesome company. It's really cool to hear how you were able to pivot from kind of corporate America to, to doing this. And, um, you know, I, I, I think as a kind of like a, a closing thing, you know, um, if someone hasn't tried jujitsu yet and maybe they're intimidated of it, what, what do you think is, is the most um, kind of, what do you think draws you to jujitsu? What do you think is the thing that, why everybody should be doing jujitsu? Uh, I think, I think one, thanks for, thanks for the nice things. There's been like, for, for in all honesty, like you've been a huge supporter of the brand and supported us when, you know, like we don't even deserve to be on, on the same stage as the stuff that you've done. So you representing and wearing the product is like hugely appreciated, you know, on, but I think, um, I think on the jujitsu stuff, I think, I think a lot of people, I think all the way around, I think people misunderstand how hard it is to walk into uh, a, a new gym, you know, and this is just your average 24 hour fitness. That's, uh, it's super intimidating and trying to walk into your first jujitsu gym to try your first class is probably that times a hundred. You know, so I think that, I think that's first and foremost. So knowing that I think, um, when the first person, and I think it's all the way around, it's not just the first person trying to do it. So I think the industry as a whole needs to get it right. They don't un truly understand that yet. So it, their first class, they don't treat their first class like that. They don't know how hard it was for that guy to really come in, you know, so that's first and foremost, that's an industry thing that culturally that, that we have to help with get business owners better at. But the second part I think is the, the actual person going in to try the class. I think the first thing is you're not going to get punched in the face. It's not MMA, right? It's not UFC. And the second part is I think it's, um, you're probably going to, you know, be doing a bunch of things that, you know, exercises and stuff that you're familiar with. And, and ho hopefully enough, hopefully if you go to a place and you get a good experience, you have normally most places are pretty good with just helping out a new person. That's, that's pretty universal. You might, there might be some places where, you know, you might have a bad experience, but I think overall, your first experience is going to be interesting, you know? And I think the biggest thing is I think um, you're going to be put in some interesting rough 
positions that are uncomfortable, you know, just because they're not natural and it kind of makes you feel uncomfortable. But on the flip side of it, that's why I think jujitsu is very like, like kind of culty in a sense, or it's very like addictive, like, cause everybody that can get past that first class or that first week of class, and they can kind of understand how much it helps them mentally, physically, um, and they get past that first scary first day, um, then it's going to really help them in their lives mentally, physically, and all the way around, you know? Uh, so I think, uh, I think it's just trying to go in with an open mind and understanding the first day is probably going to be pretty rough, um, just all the way around, or it, or it could be fantastic. That's what I wish. Right. Right. But I think realistically, I think the first class is going to be a little tough, you know, and I think um, just because your body's not used to doing some of these things, but hopefully enough, you, you know, there's a bunch of great schools out there that, you know, 80% of these people are going to be taken care of, you know, um, and if you do have a bad experience, try another spot, you know, but I think, I think honestly, if you try it for a week, two or three times a week, um, and you just kind of stick with it, I think you'll get a, be a good understanding on what it is. But I think the first day, if you have the wrong expectation for what that day is, I think it, it sets it up for like, um, uh, it's just not for me, if that makes any yeah. sense. You know? Yep. hundred percent. I couldn't agree with you more. I think it's, it's one of those hurdles where you go in, you're really uncomfortable and you know, there is that support system. There's always people there to support you, but at times it's uncomfortable and you have to be humbled, especially as like a, uh, you know, if you're used to kind of being good at things and all of a sudden you're realizing like, man, I'm not very good at this. But, but that should also motivate you and inspire you. And that's what's so beautiful about jiu-jitsu is always something to learn. And for me, you know, I definitely, I do right now, um, you know, two, three days a week privates. Um, but I'm looking forward to getting back in the group setting. And I'm, I'm really excited about where Show Your World is going. I'm excited about where jiu-jitsu is going. And I really appreciate your time and, and, and sharing with us a little bit more about the brand of Show Your World, um, especially on this podcast. And so if people want more information about your company, about you, maybe even go out there and try and find a rash guard or gi if they could even find one on your website. Cause I think everything right now is sold out. Where should they go? I think the, <laughs> thanks, I think, I think for us, it's the easiest way is just to jump on showyearl.com or, you know, our Instagram showyearl, you can follow up, uh, you know, jump on the newsletter and all the stuff that we have coming on or, or blasting out through those channels. So I appreciate you, 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 you plugging us and super stoked on all the, fitness stuff that you got going, uh, Jason, it's going to be, I'm excited to see what you guys got for the future as well. So awesome, brother. Well, thank you so much for joining us and, um, I'll chat with you pretty soon, huh? Thank you. Appreciate it. You have a good one, man. Thank you so much.